hear about a smile lighting up a room. And hers really did, every place I went with her. She had the great ability to simplify the most complex issues. One of my favorites, which I heard recently, over and over again in Nairobi, just recently, was if you destroy nature, nature destroys you. If only we could convince a few more American politicians of that. In 1991, our second year of awarding prizes, we had the distinct honor and pleasure of recognizing Wangari Maathai with the Goldman Environmental Prize for Africa. At the time, Wangari was leading a courageous fight against the construction of a skyscraper that was going to be built in the middle of one of Nairobi's few public open spaces, Uruuru Park, which was also known as Freedom Park. Her vocal opposition put her at odds with the authoritarian government of Kenya's president, then president, Daniel Arap Moy. She was vilified in the Kenyan parliament, criticized in the press, and threatened with brutal force. But it was Wangari who prevailed. And I, I want to tell you the story of my sister, you know, the pronunciation, <laughs> Wangari, from the perspective of women and from the perspective of Kenyans. Thank you so much for those of you that have lifted up from how you knew Wangari as an environmentalist, but in other forums. So what did the rural women of Kenya say of Wangari? I talked to a woman who comes from my village, a village that Wangari did not have the possibility to visit quite far away from Nairobi, but which has planted trees in memory of Wangari, including one for me. <laughs> and she told me, our sister Wangari was stronger than 10,000 men. <laughs> she's old, she's about 78. She's been planting trees just by knowing what Wangari was doing with other places for a long time. And she says, we will continue to plant trees. She's not gone. Her life lives with us. I asked another woman from another part of Kenya what they thought of Wangari. And they said, she does not just have the heart of a lion. She is a lion. And she said, and I don't mean a lioness. She is a lion. <laughs> A woman of courage. That's how we remember Wangari in our country, Kenya. A woman who could stand <coughs> for people's rights, for community rights, for women's rights, in spite and despite of her own life. We think of Wangari as a, someone that lifted up what the power of communities looks like. That indeed communities can analyze the issues affect them and make a connection between social issues, environmental issues, political issues, and economic issues, and bring them together. And Wangari was that for us. But Wangari was also a professor in our universities. I was a student at the University of Nairobi when Wangari was elected the first female dean at the university. I can tell you what that did for us as women at the university at that time. We saw in her everything that we wanted to be. And indeed, as we continue to study, we knew we would get there because she had got there before us. She was a trailblazer for us. And believe me, going for a PhD and coming to this country to study, I knew she had been here, and she had studied here, and she had gone home and made a difference. And I studied here, 
and I wanted to go home, and I did go home, like Wangari, and started my activism and my work at home. Because Wangari was that inspiration. But we see in Wangari more than what I have said to, to you. For, for this day in Kenya, we don't have any other person who had a state burial. That tells you what people think about Wangari. When you see the films, don't end there. Go to the way that she was celebrated at her funeral. And it will show you the kind of unity that goes beyond ethnicity. Because very often, when people speak about what happens in Africa, they get trapped at the ethnicity. That was not Wangari. And she showed that in Kenya. She's the first person in our country to get a state burial without being the president of our country. <laughs> that tells her story. Mm -hmm. We also, and I don't think it happens in many other parts of the world, so we are quite advanced in that. <laughs> <laughs> Wangari was also a professor, not just at the university. If you go to every village where Wangari had influence and sit with the people in those places, you will be surprised at how they are able to analyze what is happening to them. So she was a professor beyond the university halls. We learned from her, education is not something that you keep within four walls, but you've got to take it out there. And that's really what education means for us. We mourn someone that meant so much to our communities, and from the women's perspective, because I'm connected to many women in many different forms, through my work now and before, she has modeled so much more. So much more. And she has modeled what good management is, because she worked hard for succession before she died. With the representative of the, of, the, of, the, of the Green Belt Movement here that we had from Stephen Mills with Professor Karanja who succeeded his work in Nairobi. We knew beforehand that there were a lot of people that were working to progress what she has started. I personally have a little grudge on her and I'm gonna tell her, my sister, when I come, you owe me one. Because Stephen had just told me that she was coming here to San Francisco. I live here now. And Stephen had promised me that I would host her in my house. I'm not going to forget that. <laughs> so my sister Hungary, I'm still waiting. And if I don't host you in my house, you'll have to host me when I come where you are. Thank you. <laughs> I, I'm here to honor my friend, Wangari Matai. I uh, was so happy when I learned that there were going to be a, a series of these events and that one of them was going to be uh, here in San Francisco during a time when I was here but because I, I wanted to go to Nairobi. Uh, I first met Wangari Maathai in Nairobi almost a quarter century ago when I was in the U.S. Senate. and. She took me out, to, of course, to plant a tree. <laughs> uh, and I wrote about her in the first book I wrote on the global environment. She just made such an impression on, on everyone, including me. The last time I saw her was less than six months ago at my home in Nashville <coughs> on a wonderful, cool spring evening sitting out on the porch. We shared a, a long dinner together and really a very full evening. And Wanjira was there with uh, uh, Wangari's granddaughter that she loved so dearly, Ruth Wangari. Uh, and 
I, I really did not know uh, what what was to come. She kept it hidden, didn't she? Uh, very few people knew. Thank you, Huey, for your kind words about the Climate and Reality Project. Wangari was on was on the board of the Climate and Reality Project. I learned uh, so much from her, as we all did, and I thought. Uh, a good bit about what I could say here in these few words, but one thing I wanted to be sure to say is that she she made a point of saying that planting trees is important, but it's not just the planting of the tree. As those of you who worked with her closely know, her formula was to train people and inspire and mobilize people plant trees, but then to take care of the trees that they planted until they reached the stage where they could survive on their own. And there was a period of a few years after the planting where those she, she trained at first uh, almost entirely women. Now I'm so happy to hear about the Army getting involved in the uh, uh, in the planning project, but I wanted to make that point because she has planted the Greenbelt Movement and planted it here in the U.S. And those of you who loved her as I did can express that love in tending to the Greenbelt Movement <laughs> <laughs> until it can survive uh, on its own, as it will, but it, it is important to share good words about her and uh, share the wonderful memories that we have, but perhaps the best way to carry on her work and honor her spirit is by tending this wonderful, wonderful movement that she's planted. Several people talked about her smile. I was going to do that too, but then I realized immediately that that's one of the things that just everybody was struck by it immediately. And when you experience a smile like that, it's not because she used teeth whites. <laughs> it, it, it's, it, it, it's not uh, just the, the, the physical expression. You, you just knew that her smile came from deep inside her and just radiated her entire being. Isn't that right? She was really quite remarkable. And she had such a wonderful sense of humor. I remember her telling me about her experience as a very young woman when she first came to the U.S. to study, to go to college. And she was so excited. Uh, because she had received the destination. I don't know as much as I should about the program that brought her here, but she was going to be with, uh, going to live with an American family and go to college. And when she got her uh, notification, she was so excited to be going to Manhattan. And she said when she got there, to when she got off the plane and went to the orientation session, she was shocked to find that it was Manhattan, Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> she had really been excited about New York City. <laughs> and I bet she smiled when she, when she read that. But she said it turned out to be such a blessing for her, and she meant it so deeply, and she kept in touch with the the family in Kansas that she became so close to. Hemingway, of course, famously wrote about courage being grace under pressure. Many others have described the incredible pressure that she was under for so much of her life. And many of you know that the, the beatings, one in particular, uh, almost killed her. And there was another time when drawing upon, uh, you correct me if I'm wrong about the Kenyan 
culture and tradition, but as she, uh, as it was described to me, she humiliated her attackers by stripping off all of her clothes. Have I got that story correct? And, sh and shamed them by standing naked uh, in front of them. And what courage that takes. It's almost uh, uh, un unimaginable that facing the threats that she faced, that, that she would so show such incredible grace. She was also a brilliant woman, the first uh, woman to earn a PhD in East Africa or Central Africa, as many of you know. But in the conversations that I had with her, it immediately became apparent to me that she was a very deep thinker. Others have talked about her ability to connect the dots between social justice, women's empowerment, democracy, protecting the environment. And she spoke eloquently about global warming, climate crisis, often. Uh, and it was such a, a, a privilege, really, to, to be able to know her as little as I did. Uh, I was going to tell that story about the UN but you did it uh, 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 so well, uh, Roger. Uh, I didn't know the Shackley role in giving her that leverage to extract that billion uh, pledge by the UN. But I believe that at this point, they have almost reached the five billion. I think they're above three billion trees now. Is that is that correct? So her story clearly inspires so many people. And wherever she went, she was able to, to draw upon the traditions and culture and humanity of the people that she met. Just two, uh, just two very brief final comments. When she went to Japan, she engaged with her hosts and discovered the word matainai, and adopted that word. And as she said, it, the word matainai is originally a Buddhist term that refers to the essence of things, continuing in her words. It also applies to everything in the physical universe, suggesting that objects do not exist in isolation but are intrinsically linked to one another. It is also a rallying cry to reestablish such bonds and reassert the importance of treating all animate and inanimate objects with great care. It can refer not only to waste of resources, but wasteful efforts and actions, activities, time, souls, talents, emotions, minds, dreams, and potential. So when I think about her connecting the dots, she connected her, her own radiant spirit to the task of addressing injustice and destructive forces wherever she found them. She connected her, hearts, her heart to other hearts in inspiring them to join that great cause uh, that she championed. Finally, I notice on the program you're going to show the little clip of her <coughs> speaking about the hummingbird. I think it's very appropriate that she told that story because of all birds it has the biggest heart as a, in relation to its body and the biggest brain. <coughs> Uh, and as some of you know, the hummingbird is absolutely fearless. It will attack any uh, other bird of whatever size that attacks it. Uh, and so I think it's a, an appropriate image. But the story she tells is important, and I'll say this in closing, for anyone 
who looks at the scale and magnitude of the challenge posed by these incredible threats to the environment and feels, is tempted to feel, oh my goodness, it's hopeless. She says to all of us, with her smile, with her brilliant <laughs> formulations and with the inspiration of her life, it is not hopeless. And just as planting one tree can lead to billions of trees being planted, if each of us decides to do what we can, then that's the step, the essential step, toward reestablishing those bonds and completing the task that Wangari has charted for us. It is a great honor to have the privilege of speaking about her. We may not ever see her life again. She was truly unique. So thank you.